Hello, everybody. Welcome to the collaborative decision making bridging the gap between digital health and clinical engineering teams. This webinar is organized by the IFMB Clinical Engineering Division. I am Marianne Janvier, Chair of the North American Regional Group Representative of Council of Societies of IFMB and Co Chair of yeah, Women. Yes. In in medical and biological engineering committee. And I work as a clinical engineering at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa, Canada. It is my honor to moderate today. The August IFMB CED webinar in digital health contributes to increase the quality of healthcare system and colleges collaboration and improve the effectiveness of health information and more. Today's session will provide improvements, best practices and trends with evidence all to encourage the development of digital health solutions from a global and strategic perspective to enhance the clinical engineer's contribution in the healthcare system. And of course, to contribute to the quality insurance and excellence of our, pati our patients deserves. I uh, just wanna give you a, a, a few guidance. The Q&A button is available to set question and it will be addressed just at the end after the three presentation when we'll start the Q&A process. So say, Saying this, it's my pleasure to present our first speaker, which will be Elliot Sloan. Elliot Sloan is a, is a distinguished professor and business and nonprofit leader and consultant with a demonstrated history of innovative teaching, research, and publication in the higher education industry, as well as proven business management and leadership acumen. Research management operation, regulatory compliance, and quality insurance professional who is skilled in IT and business strategy, decision support, healthcare, international business education, and consulting and business process, re-engineering, and improvement. Advisor to U.S. and international government agencies in the healthcare, patient safety, standards, and regulatory fields. Some of Elliot's specialized areas include e-health, m-health, HIPAA and high tech compliance for privacy, security, and cybersecurity management, medical devices, patient safety, health information exchange, and interoperability, clinical engineering, technology management, life cycle cost management, and online distance learning. Uh, without ado, Elliot, please give sure, you the and Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks for reading that very long history and bio. Uh, the short version is I'm kind of one of the grandfathers in this field at this point and uh, have been uh, working in the field uh, to my amazement nearly half a century. Uh, I worked at ECRI for 15 years and helped build all of ECRI's infrastructure, uh, also uh, doing uh, uh, testing at the bench of medical devices for quality and safety, uh, ventilators, uh, infusion uh, technologies, oxygen therapy, et cetera. Uh, when I moved into a, the corporate world for 10 years, I was responsible for medical device and pharmaceuticals manufacturing across the United States. And uh, that's where I began to see the proliferation of uh, inter interconnectable medical devices, devices with uh, local area network and ultimately Wi-Fi uh, accessibility. Uh, in uh, 2000, I joined Villanova University and moved out of the uh, industry area into the academic area and began to look at some of the challenges of sharing the uh, resources in, in an IT infrastructure in healthcare and hospitals so that medical messages could be shared, such as life critical alarms, alerts, and uh, medical data logging. Little did I know that, you know, that has been now almost a quarter century of work in uh, this area that has been, uh, in some ways, uh, astonishingly, astonishingly successful when you look at uh, wearable uh, watches and devices and apps uh, that are available for individuals to monitor and manage your health. Uh, on the other hand, it has outstripped uh, regulations, it's outstripped our clinical engineering uh, knowledge and capability, and it's outstripped our ability to collaborate uh, with our IT uh, colleagues uh, who are running the IT enterprise in, in healthcare. Uh, oh, since about 2001, I've been also publishing articles about this CEIT collaboration. Uh, I ran a number of seminars at AMI conferences and HIMSS, the Health Information and Management Systems Professionals Conferences, bringing uh, clinical engineering department chairs and IT CEO, CIO uh, level uh, people into the discussion to talk about, well, how are we going to get along? And I say at that time, uh, the question was open, well, how much 
technology, information technology will become part of the day-to-day -day care of patients. And uh, there were a lot of people who were doubting that would happen. Uh, during the 25 years, I've worked with the WHO and PAHO and IFMBE and GCED and HIMSS, uh, all providing additional training and communication. Uh, we've We've had uh, workshops on things like smart infusion pumps, uh, on alarm safety and integration. I can help direct interesting readers, interested readers to uh, free open source uh, booklets and uh, uh, summaries of those uh, meetings because they, I think the comments that were made then are still relevant today. I think that the challenge that we face today and the opportunity we face today is that our perspective 25 years ago was quite naive. Uh, we, we were thinking about individual devices that needed to be communicating their results and uh, alarm information one by one into some kind of mothership of information. Today, we're dealing with a uh, system of systems in which we have devices that are smart or semi-smart, apps that are smart or semi-smart, uh, enterprise information systems that are smart or semi-smart, and more and more uh, artificial intelligence technologies that are trying to augment human decision-making, whether it's by the patient or by the clinician or by the Ministry of Health. The ability, our ability as clinical engineers to properly play our role is, is going to hinge on our having the, the necessary skill sets to uh, talk competently, take on responsibility competently, uh, and show leadership competently and confidently uh, in this uh, very rapidly growing and changing world. Uh, we know globally the aging population is increasing. We know globally the uh, proliferation of people with chronic diseases and uh, multiple chronic diseases, uh, the costs of managing those individuals, and also the relative shortage of physicians and nurses combine in a sort of a, a tsunami of events that we, we have to respect and recognize and we have to address. I think there's no doubt that more and more people are going to be using apps, more and more people are going to be doing self-management of their care. Uh, and all of these uh, kinds of technologies, uh, like the watch that I'm wearing has a pulse oximeter, has an ECG monitor, uh, has uh, information about my activities and, and vital signs information. All of that is relevant to me, the personal management of, of my care, but it's also relevant to my clinicians as they try to help me uh, successfully age through uh, the years ahead. So I'm going to end this part of the presentation uh, right now, and maybe we'll come back later with a discussion of some of these opportunities and needs. And uh, I look forward to sharing the, the, the rest of the uh, presentations and any information that I've published thus far, I will make available to you folks if you uh, just uh, let me know that you need them uh, at my ebsloan at gmail.com address. Back to you. Thank you, Elliot. Very interesting um, background about the information about digital health and the history and how you contributed to it uh, significantly and how many resource, resources are available. So I'm very, um, I, I like your presentation. Thank you. Um, the next speaker that we have is Ernesto Ladanza. Um, I will present who he is. He is the section editor of technology and healthcare. He's an associate editor of PLOS One. He's a health technology and of future internet and member of the scientific committee of many international conferences in bioengineering. Bio and Dr. Ernesto Ladenza is the organizer of postgraduate master courses um, in clinical engineering, healthcare engineering, and health technology assessment at the University of Florence since 2007. He is the former chair of the IFMB Health Technology Assessment Division and supervisor in 190 plus graduation thesis. He is the author of 160 plus publication on international books, scientific journals, volumes, and conference proceeding. He is the editor in chief of Clinical Engineering Handbook in the second edition. Uh, the second edition. He's also a member of the International Federation for Medical and Biolog Biological Engineering Administrative Council and the chair of its Council of Society. 
He received the IBM Faculty Award in 2013 and the IFMB CD Teamwork Award in 2019. Ernesto, please move forward. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you both for this invitation. I'm very happy I've seen a very good participation to this webinar in particular and in general to the IFMB series of webinars. So once again, thank you. Uh, once more thing, my last name is actually Ia Danza, it's not La Danza, but it's still me. So let, uh, okay, I guess uh, I could keep this presentation in uh, the interest of, of time. Just one thing I would like to, to underline is that I've been uh, dealing with, yeah, both biomedical and clinical engineering. For those of you who like this distinction, to me, biomedical engineering is, uh, deeply related to clinical engineering and vice versa. And this is testified by the clinical engineering handbook, uh, second edition, where in particular, coming to the specific topic of today's uh, webinar, we, in the second edition, we had to completely rewrite the book compared to the first edition, because, which was, by the way, just 15 years old, more or less, uh, because this profession has been changing so rapidly. And there's section nine in particular, which is dedicated to information technology and mobile lab. And it is edited by our distinguished guest today, Professor Andrew Sloan, together with me with a couple of glasses of wine in Florence here. And I hope very soon we're going to have one more, Elliot. And one more thing important uh, to set up the stage uh, in the specific topic of today's webinar is that in IFAB, the International Federation of Clinical Engineering, of course, we are all guests of IFAB today here, uh, there's a third division. This is uh, brand new, just last year, which is the Digital Health Division. And just for letting you know, as you can see, there's an interim chair uh, Professor Carvalho from Portugal and some interim members, but very soon there will be a call for elections. So if you think this is something you might want to to contribute, just stay tuned and um, apply for uh, for membership. So um, talking about uh, digital health, which is a very broad uh, spectrum of activities and topics and trying to narrow it down to artificial intelligence. Well, in the last few months, I would say, it's impossible not to think about a very specific part of artificial intelligence, which is the generative artificial intelligence. We've been used to, to leverage AI for diagnosis and for decision support systems and so forth. But today, there's a very, a very new thing. So we, we have artificial intelligence, which is capable of generating texts, of generating uh, images, and very soon also 3D volumes, and of course, other media. And we have some very new, uh, highly performing um, algorithms and technologies, like the transformed based deep uh, neural networks, which are actually game changers. So very rapidly, what I did was asking the very well-known ChatGPT from OpenAI to define uh, itself as a clinical engineer would do. And it says that ChatGPT is an advanced AI-powered language model developed by OpenAI and so forth, but it can be viewed as a versatile tool that leverages natural language process processing to assist healthcare professionals and clinical engineers in various tasks. So I was trying to understand what could be the possible role of this kind of topics, and uh, sorry, of tools in our profession, the professional uh, clinical engineering. ChatGPT is not the only player, of course. We've been hearing today of a new one from China, which is limited to the uh, Chinese market. And there's a new one from uh, from Google as well, just released, which is Bard. Same question, define yourself as a clinical engineer would do. And it says it can access and process medical data from a variety of sources. It can generate text and translate them. It can be used to develop and test new medical devices and procedures. And this could be very powerful, but on the other side also quite scary. 
if we cannot uh, competently manage all this new technology, you no, know? and and then generate clinical reports, create educational materials, leaflets, and so forth. So uh, I went uh, as I usually do when I'm preparing a webinar like this one. I went to update my knowledge in the literature, and actually there's a, a lot of very fresh and new stuff. This is powered on Nature Medicine on July 17, which is one month or five weeks ago. And so how large language models can be um, can be used in uh, in medicine. So uh, this is the link you can go in and see what is all about. But it, it's quite clear that LLMs, large language models, have now a very specific role also in uh, in medicine, and this is identified by this other article, which is slightly older, but still it's on natural nature biomedical engineering, and it's been published in um, 2021. So as you can see, it's not just language models. Here, what we have is a, a specific tool, which is called uh, GAN, GAN, which is Generative Adversarial Networks, where basically you have two neural networks uh, competing um, with each other, not between each other, so a generator and a discriminator. And what they do is that once the discriminator is not able anymore to understand if a picture was generated uh, synthetically, so by, by the network, or if it's a real one, that is when you stop your training. And this is very briefly how uh, GANs work. So in, uh, in this picture from the article, you can see on the left synthetic images and on the right real images. And how they use it? Well, actually, what they did was using, together with, or better, starting with 10,000 real images, they used uh, them to generate 10,000 more synthetic images of non-existing patients. And they used both of them to train uh, a, a machine learning algorithm somehow. So look at the results, and it's quite clear that the performance, this is the area under the rock curve, the performance are very much uh, increasing while using uh, both real and synthetic data together. But what about the quality of this synthetic data? Well, this is one of the key roles, I would say, for biomedical and clinical engineers. So uh, defining metrics having the so-called human in the loop test. So creating regulatory standards um, for synthetic data quality. This is something uh, which is today very much important and discussed. What about the bias, for example, in the synthetic data uh, we are creating? Uh, this is one new um, example. Uh, again, this was accepted on July 26th, so one month ago. And it says it's a promising start, but not a panacea. So ChatGPT, uh, as you can see from the graph, uh, in the articles, there's a very, very rapid growth in, in interest of uh, applications and possibilities involving uh, LLMs. And of course, uh, we are talking about uh, ChatGPT, but we are also talking about the so-called NLP. Uh, which stands for Natural Language Processing. And this is particularly uh, interesting for clinical engineers because we deal with a lot of tech. So think about the uh, reports you know, from maintenance. Everything is on text. So having the chance of extracting information from text, so unstructured data, is really, really, really something we should uh, at, at least be informed of and hopefully be involved in. And this is also, I, I couldn't cope with this slide because every single time I went back to, to Scopus or Scholar to search for it, and there was a new article. So this was published just a couple of days before I closed the presentation on August 24th. And Future Intern is one of the uh, journals I'm uh, involved in as associate editor. So the generative AI in medicine and healthcare promises, opportunities, and challenges. So this is the topic and we cannot pretend it's not there. We should understand and we should also uh, be able to 
uh, to use our competencies or to develop new competencies in order to to have that leadership in the field that Professor Sloan was mentioning before, so competence and leadership path through uh, science. But if I search Google Scholar with, this is nothing very scientific, I just tried and searched with a few keywords like generative AI and medicine or healthcare, I could find like more than 3,600 results, so which is uh, impressive, I would say. Everything is very new. Everything is on very important journals like Nature, like the BMJ and so forth. And then I tried to narrow it down to generative AI and biomedical engineering. And we we narrow a lot, we go to 229 results, so it's more or less 6% of the total, which is not great, but still it, it's something that is happening. But guess what happens when I search, and I did search for generative AI and clinical engineering, I could only find three results. So this is a trend we're missing, I would say. Uh, but um, for example, today and occasions like these webinars are vital in my, in my opinion. So this is what I'm urging you clinical engineers to do. So I'm sure you are using these tools, you're thinking about these tools, you're trying to regulate these tools, you need to share your findings and your opinions and, and your experiences with your colleagues. So I, I just put here a few uh, examples. These are all journals where I'm involved as associate editor or a section editor, but there's plenty of uh, journals where you want to apply. Uh, in this case, I, I really look forward to receive and read your uh, contributions because, as you saw, there's a lot going on and we are missing that train again. So uh, how this generative AI could be used just to try and come back to, 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 to a real example. For example, in predictive maintenance in healthcare, something which is the core of clinical engineers or, or, or clinical engineering, or at least it used to be so. So it could be used for synthetic failure data generation. So like the GANs I was uh, showing you earlier, they could be trained to generate uh, synthetic failure data to mimic different types of equipment malfunctions, for example. And this data can be used alongside real sensor data to train predictive maintenance algorithms. Interesting, isn't it? People is doing that. We are doing that as well. So. Data augmentation is also, you know, the problem is data. No? Today we have a lot of tools, well, we have a lot of algorithms, we have also some uh, computing power and cloud. Data is what we need. So data augmentation is really something where this kind of technologies could, could come useful. And also scenario testing. So you could create synthetic scenarios of potential failure modes, for example, think about your uh, FMECA. Well, you could try and have the support of these technologies for operating conditions that are difficult to replicate in real world testing and have some information for uh, assessing your um, uh, failure modes with FMECA or, or whatever you're using. And also anomaly detection training, uh, reducing data bias, I would uh, mention earlier, or to early warning system development. So for example, clinical engineers could uh, develop more comprehensive early warning systems accounting for a broader spectrum of potential failure scenarios. And also there's a lot that could be done uh, testing the robustness of algorithms and also human in the loop testing. So we could be involved and must be involved in interacting with these simulated scenarios and synthetic data to assess uh, their performance. So uh, using generative AI in predictive maintenance workflows uh, improves training data for CEs resulting in more precise algorithms. Yet validating these algorithms with synthetic and real world data remains something crucial for reliability in healthcare settings. This is, uh, my message today, I would say. So just very briefly to give you an example of what we've been doing, um, you know, 
uh, I've been, you might know, I've been involved for quite a long time now in evidence-based clinical engineering. So in finding some ways to actually measure the outcome of uh, maintenance and management you know, with, with different technologies. And in this case, what we are doing is classifying uh, with NLP, with natural language processing, adverse events, classifying and identifying them. And this is how it works. You have this source of information. Uh, I guess most of you are familiar with mode, which is the um, manufacturer uh, adverse events reports from FDA. And then through this process, uh, you use, uh, we use the HITBERT, which is a specific um, version of BERT technology from Google. And then what's more interesting maybe is the explainable AI. So AI used to be uh, like a black box in the past. Nowadays, it's more and more important to have the chance to explain what brought this AI to suggest to you one thing or another. So this is how it works. You have some tokens here, and now you know why that specific report has been classified in a way or another. And look at this graph on the left. Uh, you can see how health information technologies related to adverse events have been increasing from 1997, so not the other century, actually, to 20. 18, this is a bit old, but the trend is very clear. And if we had newer data, it would be, I'm sure, uh, even more steep. So just to close, and to close and not to take too much time to the next speaker, uh, you can meet me in uh, September or October in uh, these three events. First one being uh, 6 to 8 of September in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. There's the first um, biomedical engineering conference organized by ISMB in uh, in Africa, and then at the medical the Mediterranean conference, uh, 14 to 16th of September in uh, Sarajevo, Bosnia Herzegovina, and then on October 5th to 7th in, uh, in Mexico in uh, Guadalajara at the ENES Region 9 conference. So of course you could just drop me an email at this address here, and I'll be more than happy to, to discuss with you about whatever you think is relevant uh, in, uh, in this topic or others. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you for correcting your name. I had Enza. I saw Al. <laughs> Sorry. Um, very excellent presentation. It was very inspiring to see how AI can be applied in preventive um, maintenance in healthcare and how we can utilize and to see what your team has done too is very impressive of how you're utilizing the tools that are out there in order to uh, lead and uh, contribute into the field. So thank you very much for your talk. Um, the next, yeah. the last speaker, thank you, um, is uh, Rosana Rivas. I will present her to you. Rosana is a PhD candidate in the L'Ecole des Mines de Paris, France, and she is the Université de Lyon 3 de France. Um, she's a co-chair and, and founder of Health Level 7 Peru and the Board of Clinical Engineering. She's a division uh, in the division of IFMB. She's a Board Health Technology Assessment Division of, of IFMB, a member Health Technology Assessment Network of the Americas, Red ETSA PAHO. She's a member of American College of Clinical Engineering, a member of Health Technology Assessment International, a member of Health Technology Management of Committee College of Engineering of Peru. She's a board academic committee of the first Peruvian biomedical engineering undergraduate program um, managed by the partnership of two university, professor, researcher, and international consultant, a member of the scientific committee of several international conferences in biomedical clinical engineering and health technology innovation. Her awards are from American College of Clinical Engineering, ACC, and Arbus International Award, um, the Cayetano Heredia University recognition to the distinctive and outstanding standing career and contributing to the development of biomedical engineering in Peru. And every Brad Counts Coalition nominated her as a biomedical engineering leader in the Americas and in the global stage due to her tireless efforts during the pandemic to increase access to treatment for COVID-19 patients, especially for oxygen. I give you the floor, Hasana. Thank you, Mary Aisha. 
It's a pleasure to be here in this specific topic, the bridging the gap between the teams. I will ask kindly to Samantha to set the file, please, of my presentation. Thank you. So let's go to the first one. Um, my approach will be focused on the role of clinical engineers, but as members of teams. Teams in healthcare now means multidisciplinary teams. Teams mean collaboration, inaction, uh, respect for other knowledge, most of all different of the knowledge of my expertise, my professional expertise. And, and also it uh, demands uh, new focus on what is the role of the stakeholders here. Uh, it is uh, a fact that in the 21st century uh, and after the pandemic, uh, things change very much. One of or some of these facts of uh, evidences of changes brings us the certitude that our role as actors, professionals, and even patients have changed um, in a relevant way. Here, some uh, well, uh, some. Uh, Evidences uh, collected by key PMG in 2023, uh, you can observe that not only the customer-centric care is an uh, environment we are uh, expecting, observing in healthcare system, whether we talk about um, private services of healthcare or public one. The workforce is in crisis, and I would like you to go back for a while to COVID-19 and the way we were in, the, in such period, under stress, under a huge sanitary and economic crisis, the workforce and the way the teams work changed very much. Also, um, we have under an economic uh, crisis globally. And I will just finish with these three first ones to observe that if we are not aware, not just some, uh, as clinical engineers, but as healthcare professionals, if we are not aware how much the change is uh, demanding us, huge changes as well as individuals in the field, we are, we are lost and we are losing the time and resources and of course opportunities to achieve outcomes expected. Um, next one, please. Digital transformation in healthcare uh, presents also uh, this uh, kind of environment open for us uh, to answer the questions. Are we ready? Are we not ready? What do we need to be ready? To be able to align and be aligned to the responses, information, uh, quality and sustainability required in this environment, healthcare 21st century. Uh, please take a look to this again, to these three uh, first uh, statements provided now by Germany, the Directorate General and Digitalization uh, and Innovation Areas from the Federal Ministry of Health in Germany. This is not um, as a matter of opinion. This is not an opinion of nobody. This is a strong trend. We are in the wave. And of course, the times are shorter for us to be trained 
for us to be well informed and for us to be able to exchange the information and knowledge on time. Patients and the community in general are expecting good responses and in particular from the, uh, from the side of clinical engineering, we are we have the mission to respond on time and to respond correctly to the healthcare environment in the 21st century. Next one, please. One of the factors to take into account is multidisciplinary teamwork. Multidisciplinary teamwork is not a, an option. It's a mission, it's a must, it's a need if we would like to make processes, to be leading processes successfully. If we want to achieve goals, if we want to confirm sustainability, healthcare solutions sustainable, we need to work in multidisciplinary work, a teamwork. And it is uh, also evident that uh, no field, not clinical engineering, nor medicine, nor uh, architecture, have all the knowledge and all the information enough to solve the complexity and the needs that are now emerging in healthcare system globally. That's why we need to focus on training, exchanging of information, access to publications in this regard, access to trends and evidences from everywhere to be able to improve and align to our needs and respective environments, the best practices, the best interventions. Next one, please. Healthcare stakeholder roles have changed as we mentioned before, and also as Elliot Sloan and um, Ernesto Ladanza mentioned in their respective uh, interventions. Patients have changed. Healthcare staff have changed. The community in general, government, and the way the community express opinions is changing rapidly. We do need to understand that the fast, that speedness of these changes and demands and questions and dialogues requires new profiles, not just for clinical engineers, but also for healthcare staff in general. Going back again to this uh, change uh, and the way that it determines change in the role we used to have and we need to have now, the new ones, uh, it is important to remind us that this alignment is not going to come uh, as a gift. We need to invest time, economic resources, networks, and also efforts to make uh, this environment and to make real the new role we are now uh, in the mission to achieve. This type of webinars is a way. Clinical Engineering Division of IFMBE is working so hard in this type of webinars to promote and divulgate the knowledge and the best lessons, not just to get you know, the, new, the news from outside, but to use it and to improve and strengthen our own efforts in our respective sites. And it's a pleasure to have in this uh, session the contribution from Ernesto La Danza, Italy, Elliot Sloan from US, and Marie-Ange uh, Jambier from Canada. Each of them provide the real 
provide evidences of the real environment we are living on. We are in a global era. We are in a 21st century, which demands this type of network and this type of exchanges. Focus now in digital transformation and the role of actors in this uh, environment. Next one, please. Yes, uh, we said there are needs of uh, requirements and economic time, but what about human resources? What about competences? Rosanna, are you still here? Okay, she's going to join again. I think she just had a frozen uh, 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 internet connection. She's going to join back again. We apologize. Hello. Yes, Hello. we lost you for a second. Yeah. But again, thank you for coming again. back. Yes. Yes, no, no problem. I apologize. I am now with the internet with some failures. And I was asking myself and the kind attendees. Uh, what are the competences and the requirements for the workforce, us, for the human workforce? Um, we need information, we need training, we need also to be able to collaborate on time and in the best way to the discussions and exchanges of information. In this regard, uh, we are now looking on this uh, specific, um, specific uh, recommendations or uh, remarks this time from uh, our colleague Jarba uh, from um, this set of uh, factors to take into account if we talk about being useful, valuable, and pertinent in the digital transformation process. Uh, look at the end. Uh, we, knew, we do need beyond clinical engineering uh, competences. We need skills and information and work with the management area more than with the organizational practice practitioners with other colleagues from the social and other expertises uh, profiles. This is not just a wish, it's a need. And I just want to disturb you all a bit, uh, reminding that the time is passing fast. The time for us to be aligned is short. The needs of healthcare are now more complex and they are more visible than ever, which the needs, the needs and the claims from the population and the community for solutions. Next one, please. Some enablers, uh, if we would like to take into account uh, digital innovation outcomes in healthcare. Uh, here, there are some enab uh, enablers for us to remind. Uh, in the left, you have the type of them, institutional, whether they are from the actors, infrastructure, and at the end, products, services. And to the right, some specific examples in the way you can use them to uh, improve 
um, the outcomes uh, expected from the digital innovation processes. This time is the contribution from the colleague uh, Samel Pamel from uh, 2023 publication. Thank you. Next one. These last are recommendations from the World Bank. And if we think about digital health prox progress, we, if we want to contribute to the progress, if we want to expect more certitude in the progress, uh, take into account some recommendations uh, regarding three axes, uh, priorities, uh, being connected to, and the scaling, uh, how to scale. I believe that uh, World Bank give uh, always uh, provides uh, very good information and pertinent advisory as he as then uh, collect evidences and lessons learned from the world as uh, IFMB does. Uh, it is not again uh, an opinion of someone. It is evidences collected and then they provide. A technical guidance and recommendations for us to take into account. It is my um, recommendation to take into account this advisory from the World Bank if we think how to improve our teamwork, how to improve our contribution in digital transformation environments. Next, please. And this is Henselik. And Henselik invite us to think of uh, in the center of these three axes. Uh, in this side, dig digital mindset. And the other side, dig digital skill, skill, net, skill set. And in the, uh, in the top, digital implementation. Please think as um, these three uh, aspects of the system, three components of the system, if we would like to not just think about digital vision, but to act digital, to contribute in the digital in transformation process, to be a dynamic, productive, and valuable stakeholder. These three axes reminded us the approach mentioned also by Elliot Sloan earlier. This is a system of systems approach. Digital transformation set us in this approach again and again. Next one, please. Um, just to finish, um, and, and this is a contribution from this album. Uh, this century is value based is value based on good benefit from collaboration. This process needs multidisciplinary teamwork. Observe, please, is not just inside healthcare environments, traditional healthcare environments like hospitals or small clinics. We are talking about healthcare everywhere outside of the walls, in the community, in houses, outside, everywhere, in the middle of a crisis, of a pandemic, or another type of event of the environmental uh, crisis as well. Collaboration in the sight of professional involves training, access to information, to write, our findings, as was mentioned, it was mentioned by Elliot, uh, by Ernesto Laranza, publish. Please write articles and share your challenges, your difficulties, your success in this regard. Next one, please. And. I, I am very glad to share with you some evidences of uh, the contribution of clinical engineers in the digital uh, health arena. This time I provide some spots of the uh, contributions by the side of Paraguay using artificial intelligence for COVID-19 diagnosis, 
and this is an AI system based on telemedicine platform for COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, a Q and A platform remote real time dashboard for biomedical engineers and medical devices users in Kenya healthcare. Uh, this is done uh, from uh, a clinical engineering team of Kenya and uh, these both were presented in the fourth uh, International Clinical Engineering and Health Technology Management Cro Congress uh, led by CDI, FMBE, GCA, AME in US in 2021. Next one, please. Another uh, evidences of our contribution as clinical engineers in multidisciplinary team, uh, teams are this one, uh, cybersecurity in medical equipments, vulnerabilities and mitigation methods done by colleagues from Brazil and a developer driven framework for security and privacy of data in flow in the internet of medical things by authors, colleagues of Ireland. It, I am very glad to share with you this and you can find it of course in the webpage of GCA, the videos and the presentations because they are absolutely a clear talking about what we have been exchanging before. Clinical engineers and healthcare staff work together, search for solutions together, exchange knowledge and collaborate to obtain solutions, sustainable solutions together as well. Next one, please. And 2023 topics in digital health as opportunities for us to in make more and more interventions, projects, networking discussions, roundtables, etc. Uh, I am sharing today some of the topics stated by the fifth International Clinical Engineering and Health Technology Management Congress that will be uh, in short in November done in India. Robotics, 3D imaging and printing, telemedicine and remote mo monitoring, micro and nanotechnologies, personalized medicine, etc. Those are topics for us to be part of. Those are topics for us to learn, to intervene, to re make research and to collaborate. Um, next one. And this is it. I am very glad to be part of the discussion at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. It was really nice to see your presentation and thank you for your contribution. Um, now, everybody, we're in the moment of the discussion. I uh, would like to request all the presenters to open their videos to just focus on your faces. Great. All right, I have a general question that I will ask first to Elliot. What do you think is the most important areas of contribution that the clinical engineering can impact in digital health? <laughs> most important area, uh, I, 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 I guess I would say verification and validation uh, ultimately uh, is is going to be the, one of the most important areas for us to contribute to. Uh, the innovators and developers are, are typically not users, or they are users inside of um, research hospitals uh, who who have experience with experiments and patient safety. We really need, and I put in the chat box some discussion about verification and validation. It really is extremely important that the products function safely and reliably in the real medical care arena. Um, a lot of what we have today are one-off and developmental systems, and that's important. Uh, Ernesto Yadanza was explaining to us about ChatGPT and, 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 and the incredible AI innovations that, that can and are emerging, but how do we know that they're right? We, we have a lot of examples in social networks and other uh, environment where the systems generate incorrect information. 
And once we find an error, how do we fix it? It's not clear in such systems that there's a way to remediate uh, systems. So I think I think our, our one of our leadership roles uh, ought to be in being able to describe to the community what does or doesn't work and what we expect of them uh, as they bring these tools into the market. There's no reason for us to be obstacles. It's a way of uh, making ourselves, uh, I think, um, partners and leaders. Thank you so much. This is very, very insightful. Uh, what about you, Ernesto? You want me to repeat the question or do you? No, I think I got the question. Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, it, it's a it's a very tough one, and uh, it, it's so broad. So I'll try to to bring a bit of my experience. So uh, what I think uh, is that the good engineer should be a sort of director. Um, let's not um, forget that. Yeah, we have medical devices, and we have to to design them, test them, to manage, and so forth. But we have also very different contexts where these devices are used. So you have hospital, but you might have also private spaces, or you might have home, uh, or they could be wearable. So they are so different. And what uh, I, I think is needed is fantasy. So thinking about how you could use all this bunch of technology we, we are uh, able to leverage nowadays. I'll give you an example. There's a, a project I'm leading in uh, in Siena together with the hospital of Siena. It's called Ohio. It's part of the Odin Smart Hospital, big, big project in uh, in Europe. And it's all about using uh, Internet of Things and web applications uh, for clinical engineering in a hospital. So in that case, what we are doing is uh, for maintenance, using Internet of Things for tracking our devices, using a mobile app that we design and put into uh, the operation at the same hospital a couple of years ago uh, for a very different thing. So we wanted it to be used as you know as an indoor navigation system for patients and for users. But uh, it turned out that since we have also another system which was for facility management. So we had the floor plans of the hospital and we knew who is using what and where and for what activities and we have this new tool. So we put everything together, proposed the project and the European community said, uh, okay, this is interesting. And they funded us for that. So as I said, uh, I'd like to, um, to try and see the clinical engineer as the only one who could actually design and lead this kind of complex uh, processes. You know. And yeah, that might be maybe my point. Thank you, Ernesto. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Rosanna, I know we have two minutes, one minute, but uh, you can go ahead. Um, yes, yes. I, I would just uh, remind uh, three issues. If we want to validate a prototype or if we want to as make assurance of the sustainability of an intervention or a new service based on digital health, uh, we need to be sure that we, as clinical engineers, engaged the patient before and through the process, engage the community before and through the process, and also engage this, we, I hope, I wish, have engaged the diverse professionals of healthcare staff engaged, involved in the process, project, or intervention based on digital health. If this is not take in, taken into account, you will find for, or for sure uh, failures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hosanna. It's very well said. So without um, any view, I was really impressed with all of the valuable contribution of the present presenters, the distinguished speakers today. Uh, thank you very much, Ernesto, Yadanza, Eliot Sloan, and Rosana Rivas. It's really appreciated. Each of you contributed to make a remarkable conference today. Uh, digital health contributes to the quality of life and strengthens the population access to health 
and knowing and understanding the evidence and strands from a global perspective on digital health professional teams is key to strengthening and scaling the unexpected healthcare outputs. On behalf of the RFMB and Clinical Engineering Division, it's my pleasure to thank all of you, uh, all of you for your attendance, and look forward to keep communicating. Um, I'm sure there'll be a next webinar, um, and IFMB will send that forward. And I say goodbye to you, and or good morning to some of you, or good night, and thank you for attending this uh, webinar, and thank you to all the speakers. Thank you so much. Bye, bye and thank, thank you so you. much and for moderating this session so well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, bye to everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Mary Anch. Thank you, Ernesto, bye. Elliot, Samantha. Bye. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye.